You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. Sometimes writers feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. Sometimes we need to slow down and remember the simple pleasures in life. Good coffee, good books, and good company. Come on in. Take a seat. The coffee's just been brewed. Let's see who we have in the coffee shop today. Gotta love the coffee shop. Always bright and shiny and sparkly and filled with books and the authors who write them. John, John Bragg, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. You've got two books sitting on the table. I see the one on the top is The Protocols of Yuma, and it's got your name on it. It does. It's actually Uma, like uh, Uma Thurman, although she was not the inspiration for the title. Okay, sorry about that. Didn't mean to misstate the title there. I was reading upside down. So why don't you tell me about the protocols of UMA and what genre is it? And tell me a little bit about the plot. Okay. The protocols of UMA is a, is book one in a science fiction series called the journeyers tale. Uh, Journeyers is plural. Um, Generally speaking, it is the story of a society that is on the verge of collapse and they are looking for options uh, as to how it is they're going to be able to preserve themselves in the face of um, um, other species on their planet that are trying to eliminate them, and they have certain belief systems and legal systems that they're trying to uh, continue to observe, although there's some suspicion that perhaps these systems uh, are counterproductive and they kind of have to weigh you know, do we continue to follow all of these traditions or or do we have enough suspicion about why they're in place to uh, uh, abandon them and, and maybe try some, some other approach to uh, making decisions for ourselves? Sounds fascinating. So it's a culture that's essentially 
the whole culture is being challenged. Yeah, what has happened is um, the culture, the Ume is, is the name of the people, uh, and they, um, they live on an island. It's a big island in the middle of a large freshwater lake, basically, and they never really leave the island very limited exposure to the outside world. There are certain instances where they do. And they are governed by a set of laws known as the protocols. And one of the one of the restrictions of the protocols is that their technolo- their technology levels are frozen at a certain level. Uh, they're not allowed to improvise, they're not allowed to improve any of their processes or tools or anything. And the way that that's done is through sort of a quasi-religious faith in this group known as the journeyers. And the journeyers are allowed to use higher technology. They travel into space. They're the ones that are searching for uh, a place that they refer to as Haven, which is uh, the the, the new planet that they're all going to uh, go to to be safe. And, And the primary threat that they face is from another species um, that lives on the other side of the lake, so to speak, on the mainland, that are known as the Heck. Um, and they have gathered information to indicate that the Heck, which is you know, typically seen by them as a very primitive uh, species, has miraculously developed uh, levels of technology um, that they didn't have before, and they did it in an extremely short amount of time. And so... The, the protocols had provided a guideline um, of time, basically to say this is how long you have before we think the heck are going to be able to have the technology to come to where you are and eliminate. You. And that 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 line that they have to, to they have to beat is called critical closure. Uh, when critical closure arrives, according to the projections. That's when the hex technology will reach a certain level and they will be able to overcome the natural barrier uh, of the lake and the water and all that sort of thing and actually get to where uh, the Ume are and eliminate them. And, and the problem now is that with this new information of this sudden acceleration of their technology that throws off all the calculations about when critical closure is going to be and really puts a lot of pressure on the society to start making some decisions about uh, what they're going to do uh, in reaction to that information. That sounds fascinating. I mean, to see a whole culture having having to essentially examine its values and its belief system. Sounds well, like and, and what I what I tried to do was the, the, the protocols are were, were given to the Ume at some indeterminate time in history by this group that's known only as the directors. And the directors are historical figures that are revered um, by the Ume, even though at this point they really don't know that much about who the directors were or what the reasons were for them imposing the protocols on them. What they have is a group known as the chroniclers, who are sort of the historians of the Ume. They're sort of almost like a priestly caste. And they uh, are the ones that are knowledgeable about what the protocols say and how they're implemented, although even they don't have um, a very uh, good understanding as to what the purpose of the protocols were. So you have a situation where you have this very old sort of venerated set of laws and restrictions uh, that have been followed for longer than anybody could guess that now actually seems to be contrary to their very survival. Because if they were, you know, for example, allowed to expand their technologies, they would be better able to deal with the threat of this, you know, violent primitive species that's supposedly out there trying to hunt them down. But one of the limitations of the protocols is that they can't do that. Their only option is to find a new home and then relocate. So that's, that's sort of the tension is, you know, there's a, uh, we revere long held beliefs and laws and rules. 
without sometimes understanding what their purpose was originally and whether or not that purpose still makes any sense in the present setting. So that's a incredible premise that you're working from. What inspired you to put this into a sci-fi fantasy novel? Um, that's an excellent question. And I can't give you a fantastically accurate answer to it without giving up a lot of significant plot points, but I can give you sort of a big picture answer. Um, I have uh, an hour commute each way to work five days a week. So I have roughly 10 hours of windshield time every week just doing nothing but driving. And you can only listen to so much sports talk radio or NPR or podcasts or whatever it is that you listen to in the car. Eventually, your mind is going to wander and you're just going to need to start thinking about things. And um, I, I'm a, I was a, a history major in college, and I have always had an interest in what I describe as the wheels of history, the big picture, um, not so much the importance of certain specific events or certain individuals, but sort of the overall view of why things happen eventually the way that they do. And one of the things is how societies hold on to belief systems. Uh, they become less uh, concerned necessarily with where the belief system came from. Um, the, the, the belief system itself takes on uh, an importance um, independent of its original reason. And sometimes there are consequences for that. So, um, and, and those belief systems get propped up by things like um, religion, or they get propped up by things like um, groups who have power that don't want to give up power. Um, they don't really necessarily care, you know, what the origin of the belief system is or what the value of the belief system is. If that belief system is what um, is the foundation of their authority, then they're going to defend it regardless. And and sometimes there are consequences for that. And those are some of the conflicts and some of the stresses between the various characters and the situation that they find themselves in the book. Wow. I can, <clears throat> I can see how maybe some modern day events may have encouraged you to put this into a sci-fi fantasy realm. Um, well, I don't know so much current events. It, 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 I guess it's possible, but I think that there are certain... Um, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, although some people say that that's the case. Uh, some people will say it doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it sort of rhymes. I'm not sure if that's necessarily true either, but you do have certain fundamental uh, behavioral consistencies within the people that live on our planet uh, that, that cause similar situations to recur uh, time and time again. Um, one of them is, you know, Lord Acton's famous statement about how power corrupts and absolute power cor corrupts absolutely. And there is, well, there's more than one. There's a, two or three characters uh, in this story um, that are very good examples of that. Uh, power for power's sake is, is, is very uh, attractive, and uh, it's something that people uh, uh, get drug into sometimes without knowing it and sometimes knowing it entirely and just rolling around and enjoying it. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the theme too, in both protocols and in the, the second book in the series is also available. It's called blinding sky. There's, there's a tension with the characters and then done in different ways of how they struggle with what is their responsibility to society in general and what is their responsibility to themselves? And what do you do when those two things are in conflict? How do you decide which one should take priority? And this is particularly the case with certain characters who are seeing how this is developing in terms of, you know, the heck are accelerating their technology levels. They're going to be here a lot sooner than we ever thought that they were going to be. We're not going to be ready. So from a certain standpoint, certain people could conclude that, my gosh, you know, things are going to be coming to an end here pretty quick. 
maybe it's time for us to abandon this long-term plan where everybody's working for everybody else's salvation and it just becomes you know every man and person every man and woman for themselves um is hope is hope lost some people think that maybe it is some maybe think that it's not and are more willing to continue to work for the common good um and and, and that brings those characters with different perspectives into conflict with each other i think your take on the saying absolute power you know power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolute i can even think of a, a modern day current news example okay kim jong un yes um he has many 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 problems although i would agree with you that his love of power is one of them certainly of course he was he basically inherited a country just by virtue of his birth yes. and yes yes I don't know how much you know about North Korea, but he is actually revered as a god, or actually the yeah, sun. It, and it's, it's just, a very, it's a very strange society, that's for sure. It is, and unfortunately, I've well, fortunately or unfortunately, I've learned quite a bit about it over the past year or so from the research I've done for my other show. And I was just thinking mm-hmm. that sounds like a little dictator I can think of over in North Korea. It, it's similar, and there is there's one villain in particular, and in the reviews that I've gotten for both of these books so far, the one the one response that's pretty common is that readers love my villains, um, and to some extent, the villains, of course, are in conflict with one another. They're not necessarily have common interests, but there's one villain in particular who. I, I love to write. I mean, when I when I get to a point when I'm working on these books, and I get to work on a scene where where it involves this villain, it like kind of amps me up a little bit because it's such a fascinating character. Um, power uh, for the sake of power. I'm evil because I can be, and you can't stop me. And I like to be evil. You know, it's. Uh, I, I was thinking back to uh, this reminded me. And, and I, I make strange connections between things sometimes in my head. But I remember after I'm old enough and then some to remember uh, the whole ordeal when Bill Clinton was president and they had the whole thing with Monica Lewinsky and all that. And then later on, after he was done being president, somebody was interviewing him and they said, what was it? What was the reason why you decided to involve yourself with this young intern in the White House and Bill Clinton Say what you will about the guy, like him or not, but he's a, he's a smart guy. He's a bright guy. Yes, uh, he has I'll person, concede he has that some personality. One. He has some personality flaws, but, but he's intelligent. And he said, you know, he goes, I did it for the worst possible reason, because I could. And that is, uh, for me, a, a, a really interesting motive for a true villain is... I do these things because I can, and I enjoy it, and you can't stop me. And that, that is, that's the motivation, basically, for the, the character that turns out to be the primary villain in this story. Well, I think that is a fascinating, fascinating also modern take on things. So you definitely do draw some inspiration from the real world, even if you don't set it in a you know, modern day American or even world setting, you definitely do draw some inspiration from, I think, the people in, of history. I do. And I was, you know, I've always been um, a very active reader. And for most of my, I mean, I, I've read a lot of fiction, but in the last, or at least until I started writing these books, I would say in the, I don't know, five to seven years leading up to when I started writing. I was reading primarily nonfiction. I read a lot of biographies. I read a lot of popular science. I read, um, for example, I mean, I'm kind of a nerd, I guess, as far as that goes. I was, I've been reading, when I have time, the Oxford series on American history. You know, they'll have a volume that's 700 pages long that might cover a period of 25 years. And so, uh, I have a pretty good understanding, at least, of Western history and kind of the things that have happened and why they happened and the underlying philosophies and that sort of thing. So that definitely is a, a big influence on my storytelling. And then as I got into 
writing sci-fi, um, I thought, you know, I should probably, I wanted to sort of sample some of the classic. I had read some of the classic sci-fi stuff, but I hadn't probably read nearly as much as, as I would have wanted to. So I went back and I read books like, you know, Dune and Mechanical for Leibowitz, and I read uh, Childhood's End and uh, Clockwork Orange and stuff, you know, that's considered sort of some of the classic works in science fiction, just to sort of get a better grip on sort of the roots of the genre. Um, and, you know, it's all over the place. And, and the thing that's nice about science fiction as well as fantasy, which which I will probably write some of in the future, is that you have an additional tool in your box uh, in either genre that allows you to come up with uh, an ability to really put different um, ideas in conflict with one another that isn't always easy to do if you're writing in just a sort of a contemporary fiction sort of a genre. And, and the tool that you have with science fiction, of course, is technology. And the tool that you have in fantasy is magic. And if you need to come up with something to put a really interesting twist on something, you know, if you're writing a, a book that's set in, you know, 1990s New York City, that doesn't have any of those elements, sometimes you're kind of hamstrung with how you can twist things around. But if you're in a science fiction or, or a fantasy setting, you know, you can you can whip out some technology or you can whip out some magic and 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 twist things around a little bit and present sort of a different perspective on what might otherwise be kind of a classic conflict. So that's why it's fun to write you know, in, in, as a, in the science fiction genre. And I assume it would be the same thing writing writing as a fantasy author. Now, you seem like you have one of those very logical, well-ordered, reasoned minds. And so I'm guessing that everything that you put in your book actually makes sense in your world. I hope it does. Um, and that, you know, that kind of goes towards the writing process. You know, you, um, you write things down. And, of course, as you're doing it, you think it's terrific or you think it makes sense. You think that all your sentences are grammatically correct. Et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll go back and you'll do some editing or reworking and you'll discover that, oh my gosh, you know, this doesn't make any sense or that doesn't make any sense. Or, you know, what, what I found is because I have all that drive time back and forth to work, I'll be driving to work and I'll go, oh my gosh, you know, I said that this happened back here, but then later on, you know, this happens and that's impossible. So I need to make a note to myself to go back and, and fix that. So, and then as you get within a, you know, down the, through the process of ways of, of putting the book together, you know, you have other people read it for you. I'm, I'm fortunate that I have uh, a couple of people. My wife, for example, is an unbelievably good uh, copyright editor. She's very good at spotting grammatical issues. She's very good at spotting punctuation issues and, and sentences that don't make sense and that sort of thing. And she loves to read, and she's more than happy to, to help out with that. And then I also have a friend who has an extensive hard science background. And she's also a, a very uh, uh, active reader in both science fiction and fantasy as well. So she's familiar with all these genres, and she's kind of my sounding board for either does this make sense from a scientific standpoint or – does this make sense from a plot standpoint? And so she's been helpful for me uh, because she'll she'll read she'll read some of my you know writing ahead of time and sort of say, well, what about this or what about that? And so I think every good writer or every writer that that cares about trying to put out a decent product needs to have people like that because editing your own work, whether it's copyright editing or plot editing is almost impossible because your brain just becomes blind to your own mistakes and you need to let other people put their eyes on it and find them for you. And I think that brings up an excellent point. And I'm going to mention that as a reader, I read both traditionally published, self-published, indie published. I'm such a voracious reader. My poor Kindle can't keep up with me. In fact, it can't even hold my entire digital library. And the one yeah. thing that will turn me off from a book is one where there's either stuff that makes no sense, like 
Suddenly, the Washington Monument showing up in Detroit for no valid reason, <laughs> blocked, backed up by anything. Right. Or <clears throat> something that just goes against the entire, everything the author set up to this point, and suddenly the author is going, oh, well, now it can happen just because I said so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Wait, wait a minute. I'm willing to suspend disbelief, but you've got to give me a why. Right. And those are my yeah. two big things. And I think sometimes writers who don't have enough outside eyes looking at their material may be just a little too close to their own writing and they see what they meant to see say in their heads and their heads are just kind of fill in the blanks. But the reader only has the words on the page. That's exactly right. Like, like I said, or as I've heard it described, is you're sort of you're blind to your own mistakes. And uh, it's just... You're, it's just the way the human mind works, I think. So, but I agree with you entirely. So, you mentioned you have this, you know, ten hours a week. How do you go over your books while you're driving? Are you listening to them? Well, the okay, the the, the first two books in the series, Protocols and Blinding Sky, were originally um, one book, and I started writing them in probably I don't know two thousand and. Ten. So to get those two done, it took me about five years. And, and the significance of that time period is that when I started writing those two books, my children were two and six, and they both had you know very early bedtimes. And the plan was uh, I didn't want the writing to take away from family time. So generally speaking, I did my writing at night. After they had already gone to bed, um, I you know couldn't really do anything in the car other than just brainstorm with myself. And so then I, I got these two books done. They were too long, at least according to the guidelines that I was seeing, you know, on various websites that said if you're a first-time author, you can't write a book that's any longer than this. You know, if you're Stephen King or somebody and you want to roll out an 800-page epic, that's fine. But if you're John Bragg, you probably should should wait until your fourth or fifth book and you won a few awards and sold a few million books. So I took the, the book that I had and I split it into two. And Protocols ends, in, and this is sort of an, an homage to sort of the old time serial uh, TV and radio programs, some of which were sci-fi that, that we used to have back in the day. Protocols ends in kind of a classic cliffhanger. And then Binding Sky starts literally where Protocols ends. So, uh, and that also, and I'm also working on the third and final book in the trilogy. And that, to a certain extent, explains the time gap between uh, the publication is, is that the first two books were essentially done at the same time. Uh, and, and then I just had to go back and take the first half and polish it up and get it out as protocols. And then I did some marketing and so I did some book signings and that kind of thing. And then I did that for a few months and then I went back and polished Blinding Sky, got it together, uh, and then got it out before I went and did a little more you know, pub, uh, uh, book signing marketing, that kind of thing. And then I finally, by this time, of course, my kids are much older. They stay up much later. They have a lot more activities. And because I'm still trying to, uh, uh, you know, make, maintain them as a priority, my writing time has gone down some. So, but, but I'm also, I think, more productive now, um, during any particular session of writing because I've done it enough and I kind of am able to move things along a little bit better. So, but the process is slower for those. For those reasons, so I'm going to blame my kids on that. Well, every writer has their own methods when it comes to writing. So, are you a plotter? So, do you have an outline of where this third book is going, and you already know how it ends and every step along the way? Or are you one of these people? You're you know where you're picking up from, but you're not quite sure how it's all going to turn out. <laughs> I I would say I'm a combination. Um, you know the the. Discussion groups refer to those people as plotters and pantsers, P-A-N-T-S-E-R-S, because they write by the seat of their pants. Yep. I would say if I lean more one way or the other that I'm actually a pantser. I know in a, in a big picture sense what's going to happen, 
I don't necessarily know all the details when I start. Um, but what I think is interesting is because I'm developing characters as I'm moving along, I'll reach certain points in the plot and I can kind of say, okay, what, is, what would this character do here? What's consistent with what we know about them and who they are? And, and so they actually become, for me, sort of a, a, they become forces that move the plot along kind of on their own. Um, you know, not entirely, obviously, because I still get to decide what it is, but it, it helps me remain consistent with, with those particular characters. Now, I know what's going to happen um, from the beginning to the end, and I know that I have a general sense of what's going to happen in the middle. Uh, the details, you know, I say that's where the devil is, and, and I think that people who write the way that I write, sort of on the cancer side um, uh, of the gauge there, we have to do a lot more editing at the end, particularly for plot consistency, because I know people, or I've interacted with people who are, are plotters, and they literally will have an outline. I mean, step A, step B, B sub 1, B sub 2. And they almost have it to the point where every scene in the book is sort of scheduled out in advance. And then they work on each individual scene. I, that, I just, I can't do it that way. I know there are some people that work and have to have that level of organization. But for me, that level of organization, I think, would sort of smother the creative aspect of it. And so I'm much more comfortable producing things more on the fly. But then when I get done at the end, because I didn't have that skeleton that I was building things onto, I have to spend more time making sure that, you know, all the uh, lines connect to the right dots and that sort of thing. Well, <clears throat> actually, in my mind, you sound like the hybrid writer is what I call, I've termed them. You know, plot point A has to happen, plot point B has to happen, and plot point C has to happen, but how you're getting from A to B and B to C, that's what you don't know. And yeah, I, I mean, there's probably some... There's probably some truth to that. And I have to say, John, that that puts you in very good company, at least in my opinion. One of my favorite traditionally published authors, number one New York Times bestselling author multiple times over, Brad Thor, writes in much that way. He knows he has to have plot point A, plot point B, and plot point C, but Mm -hmm. he has no idea what's going to happen between A and B and how he's getting from A to B to C. (laughs) Until he sits down and writes it. Well, it can be interesting because sometimes I'll sit down and I'll type and I'll, I'll have a, a stretch of a text that I've worked on. And when I got done, I'll be thinking to myself, well, I didn't really plan on going in that direction. That's just sort of what happened. And here we are. And I kind of like it. And if it doesn't work, I can always go back and fix it later. So it's, it's kind of entertaining for me because sometimes I'll sit down and start to work. And it's like, I can't wait to find out what's going to happen next. You know, and it's my story. So that's, that's that's kind of a strange thing to say, but that, that's something that I've experienced a number of times too while I'm writing. And I'd have to say, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. Well, that's true. And surprise is, uh, you know, you can't beat readers to death over the head with surprises. But if they see everything coming from ten miles away, they're not going to be very entertained. I don't. Right. I mean, you've got to foreshadow at least the big picture, but you can have some small things crop up that just, whoa. Yeah, absolutely. Can't, can I, it's got to be it's got to be unpredictable. You want to give them a chance to try to guess maybe where things are going, but if you can give them a good uh, a good head fake, then that's that's a that's a win for everybody. And I think it m- makes for a great great read. Yes, absolutely. Well, we have reached the time where it is time to pay those radio station bills. So, we are going to take a brief commercial break. I'll pour us some more coffee. And I will see you on the other side of this commercial break. All right. 
Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care not to be dictated to by bureaucrats stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people exercise your freedom join liberty health share and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you call liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY again that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org again that's libertyhealthshare.org sometimes riders feel lost unsure why a passage may not be working it takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. <laughs> All right, I thank you guys for hanging in there with us while we paid those radio station bills. And yes, John Bragg is still with us, and we are discussing his series, The Journeyer's Tale. So you went with the self-published route. What made you pick self, self-published self over traditionally published? Um, I didn't really know a whole lot about either process when I got to the point where I was ready to publish. So I I looked into the traditional route. I I found some online sources to get names of agents, names of publishers, you know, looked at all their different uh, submission requirements, that sort of thing. Uh, I read in some groups that I'm involved in, information, people's experiences, and I sent out, I would say I spent probably, I don't know, two or three weeks maybe really kind of making a concerted effort to get submissions out or, or con- make contact with either publishers or agents to try to go that route. And, you know, they, they will oftentimes you'll send out an inquiry or whatever, and you might not hear anything back for six months. And so I, I was just kind of ready to get it out there, and I, I didn't really care so much about how many books I was going to sell or anything. I had spent so much time writing it that I just wanted to get it out there for people to read, just to see kind of what people thought. So I looked into the self-publishing um, aspect uh, approach to it and just decided to do that because it was easier and faster. And self-publishing has lost a lot of the negative stigma it once had. You know, it has. I, I try to be um, I try to be supportive of the independent author community, and I do that by reading oh I don't know maybe three or four books a year by independent authors and writing reviews and and that sort of thing because that's what that's what really helps independent authors is is just having somebody read it, review it, get an idea of what it's about. Um, Some of it is, some of it's better than others. Um, I think that that part of the issue that readers have with independent authors 
is that it seems like too often they, they the writers don't really go that extra mile, even just on like the uh, the grammar and usage editing, the copyright editing is what I what I would call it. And you know, some readers are more forgiving of that sort of thing than others. Uh, some readers see typos or, or misspelled words, and they're just you lost them. You're not going to get them back. It doesn't matter. If the story is good or entertaining, they've just decided this is not something I'm going to put my time into. And that may be fair and it may not be, but it's, you know, it's reality. But, you know, we've also had in recent years, at least from a commercial standpoint, we've had some books that were originally uh, self-published that were tremendously successful. Um, everything from, you know, the Fifty Shades books, which... I have not read and never will. <laughs> um, to I think even um, the Twilight books were also, at least the first one was originally uh, independently uh, published, and then we had like The Martian came along and, and was independently published. So, and I want to say that Wool, uh, Hugh uh, Howard's uh, book, was originally uh, self-published too. So. You have some that have been tremendously successful, uh, and, and, and people know that originally they were self-published, and so maybe that you know opens them up to, to, to reading you know books that are that are done that way a little more than, than they would otherwise. And then the other the other factor is cost. You can go and find all kinds of self-published options, at least as an as EPUB format. You can find them for 99 cents, or a lot of times they're free, and so uh, that's very attractive to people, obviously. It is very attractive, and that's one thing I find I find that a lot of authors enjoy is that they can run specials just because they choose to, or even give their book, you know, if it's a series, they can give the first book away to entice you to read, purchase the other two or three, and it's right. something a lot of independent authors do. Yeah, and in fact, I've I've recently done that um, with protocols. It, you know, there both books are available through Amazon and through Create Space and Smashwords. Um, very, you know, fewer and fewer people are actually buying paperbacks. The, the e-publishing uh, Kindle route is becoming incredibly popular, and so and e-books are cheaper too. Um, and there are library lending programs where you can get them for free, et cetera. But, but I recently, through Smashword, um, I've made the, the ebook version of Protocols is free now. Uh, I anticipate leaving it that way. Um, just for the reason you mentioned, I, I think uh, it's gotten good reviews by the various people that have read it so far. And my hope is that you know, people will take a shot you know, at, at no risk, basically, except their time. Um, enjoy it enough, um, then they might be interested to see, you know, where the story goes from there. So I think it's fascinating, though. I will, like I said, my Kindle, I have so many ebooks. My Kindle can't even hold them all. There's no way my <laughs> house could hold the number of physical books that I own in digital format. Right. And my wife, my wife loves her Kindle. I cannot bring myself to, to do it. I have to have, and maybe it's just, me being old school or whatever, but I have to have a physical paperback book in my hand. And I've tried reading on the Kindle, and it's just I, I can't I can't make myself do it. So I just uh, I, I don't know. I just I think the, the having the feel of the book and 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 the crinkle of the paper and that sort of thing. I just think books have a, sort of a soul, I guess, that the that the e version of it uh, doesn't have. But that's just me, and I'm probably in the minority on that. Well, you may be in the minority, and I do enjoy still the feel of a book in my hand. However, my husband's active duty military. We move every three to five years, and there's a weight limit. A lot of boxes. So our house rules become you can have two favorite authors that you get their stuff in physical book form. Everything else is digital. Wow. Oh, well. As long as you uh, enjoy the, the Kindle approach, that, that's fine. Well, Better I, than not reading at all. Oh, I could never not read. I've been accused of reading the cereal box on the breakfast table more than once just because it sat there too long. <laughs> well, 
Well, they wouldn't put letters on there if they didn't want you to read it, right? Yep. I mean, if it's got words or it's got letters, it's something I can read. I'll read it. I am a voracious reader. And I, I, I miss reading because my my time, my spare time is limited just because, I, like I said, I try to make sure that I have plenty of time for my kids. And so I, I either have time to read or I have time to write. I usually don't have time to do both. And so when I'm taking a break from writing, I'll try to read as many books as I can. And then, of course, then it's like cold turkey and then I'm writing and all these books are piling up that I want to read, which I guess kind of motivates me to hurry up and, and finish getting my whatever it is that I'm working on done so I can get back to reading for a while. So, But I haven't had a time, I haven't had a chance to really read much since I started on, on book three in this series. And, and I'm, I already miss it, but it's just a, it's just a lack of uh, time resources problem. Oh, trust me. In fact, uh, I have a significant amount of windshield time certain times of the year myself, and I fill it with books even when I'm behind the windshield. The audio books. That's something else I've never been able to get into, and and, and I don't know why that is. I think maybe I I see the the act of reading for me is more active, and the audio books is kind of more passive. Plus, I'm afraid it might put me to sleep if it wasn't a very good story, and that's not good for anybody, so... Like I said, I get into the audiobooks, especially when I've got a 16-hour drive. Oh, yeah. You can only, like you said, you can only listen to so much radio of any kind. Right, right. And I can't download a new podcast that easily on the road. Of course I can, but it's just one more thing for me to fumble with. And if I'm driving 70 miles an hour on the interstate, that's a safety hazard. Absolutely. Yeah. So my solution is I have an iPod in my vehicle. Its sole existence in life is audiobooks. Wow. It has no music, well, maybe 10 songs on it because they're my absolute favorite. But otherwise, it's audiobooks filled hmm. with two or three, you know, bunch of audiobooks. And sometimes I'll even go back and find an old, you know, if I don't have a new one I want to listen to and I can't find anything good in the audiobook store. I'll pick out an older one that I, I've read, but I've never listened to the audiobook version. I only buy the unabridged audiobooks. Hmm. And they yeah, that's, t- that's another thing I haven't 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 done. I, love- I do do uh, I do do some um, oh, what's it called? There's there's a iTunes University, and you can download um, lectures from you know Yale, Harvard, Stanford on just about anything you want. Uh, and I usually do it on historical stuff or philosophy or whatever. Um, but I usually only do it if I like have to fly somewhere. Um, and I, I'll listen to a lecture or something like that. But um, sometimes it just helps me, you know, fall asleep so I can get through the flight faster. And I can't do that if I'm driving. At least I shouldn't. So that would be uh, that would be too risky. Like I said, it's. It's a fascinating thing about how everybody chooses to enjoy books differently. And it could be book in the hand, toes in the sand. It could be pop your earbuds in and you're listening while you're jogging. The Kindle on a sunny day out in the park. I had a friend that basically did the entire Harry Potter series like like that while she was running. So I don't know. I don't know how much I would comprehend if I did it while I was exercising, if I was just kind of sitting there listening, I could do it. But I think if I were busy doing something else, I, I wouldn't process it very well. Actually, it's funny you say that. I got my start on the Harry Potter series on one of said long car rides. The fourth oh, okay. or fifth book had just come out, and I had to make a, a drive halfway across the country. And it was an emergency drive, so there was no time to really plan and my husband was shocked that I'd never read any of the Harry Potter books. Hmm. So this is how the iPod in my van came to exist. He grabbed my iPod and put the first one on it. Well, we got through the first one. So, of course, we had to get the second one for the drive home. And that led to the third and the fourth. Now, we have them in physical format as well. But at the time, with the, all the driving we were doing, neither one of us could stand to hold a book in our hands because we were making that emergency drive. Right. It was for right. a death in the family, my immediate family. Uh-huh. It was my mother's funeral we were going to. Right. 
So I needed a distraction, to say the least. Oh, I bet. Absolutely. And it, it worked. I got, you know, in between, you know, we'd stop the books when I had to make phone calls, you know, or we'd get phone calls. But the great thing about having the iPod in the vehicle was my vehicle will actually pause the book and let me answer the call. And then when I hang up, it picks back up right where it left off. That's nice. So, bonus. There you go. So you you uh, are plotting your third one, and it's sci-fi, sci- sci-fi fantasy, or science fiction, I'm sorry. Just science fiction, right? Science fiction. I apologize. Can't read my own handwriting today. And you say you might actually consider doing a fantasy. Now, would that be a whole other series, or would you spin off some part of, part of your current characters? How so would you approach that? I think that? when the journeyer's tale is over, I'll move on to do something else. I have a couple of three other ideas that I'd like to explore. One of them, one of them is kind of a dark fantasy, um, and the other one is actually a superhero story. Um, I was a big fan of, I collected comic books when I was a kid, and I'd given some thought to how I would do the superhero genre if I were a writer, as opposed to the traditional approaches that the, the main comic companies, Marvel and DC, do them. And so I, I might look into that at some point, but I would guess the dark fantasy story will probably will probably come next. So we can expect more books from you in the future and more visits to the coffee shop, I'm hoping. I hope I hope for both, yes. Oh, I love repeat guests. So if you had a tip for people who are just getting started, you know, writing and they're not sure what direction to take or how to go about it, or they're stuck with writer's block, what what advice would you give them? Wow. Um, you know, there's a joke that... that that gets batted around. I'm a member of a number of social media groups that discuss the writing process and how to deal with certain situations. And one of the, one of the things that we'll throw out there is that if you get hooked or if you get stuck on a, a in a plot rut, you can't get it to go where you want to go or you don't know where you want it to go. The phrase that gets rolled out there is just blow something up. And, and, of course, they don't necessarily mean that literally, but what they're saying is, you know, it's the equivalent of I can't get my car to start, so I'm just going to take a wrench and bang on the engine until it gets going. Um, because what you have to do is you have to start moving again. You may not necessarily be moving in the direction where you're going to really end up wanting to go, but at least you're not stuck anymore. And eventually, once you get yourself going, um, you'll find your way back to where you want to be and, and get out of that rut. So, you know, do something drastic, you know, have uh, some unbelievable event take place and spin off of that. And then you can always go back and fix it later if it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, to take that wrench out. It's like, a, was it one of the movies? Uh, it was either Deep Impact or the other one where, you know, the meteor is, is heading for Earth and they're trying to, to, to blow it up before it destroys the planet and the Russian uh, astronauts trying to get the spaceship to work and, he, and it's not going. So he just grabs the big iron wrench and starts pounding on the panel and it magically kicks on. You know, sometimes with your writing, it's, you don't need finesse. You need to just bang things around a little bit just to kind of get the blood flowing again. And, and uh, then you can redirect it later on. So because it's too easy to kind of just wallow around and, oh, my gosh, I can't think of anything right. And it becomes sort of paralyzing. And so just do something crazy and get things going again. And once you get moving, you'll, you'll get it back in the direction you want it to go. Well, I think that's wonderful advice. Is there anything you wanted to talk about on the coffee shop that we haven't covered? Um, I wanted to, I wanted to mention um, just real quick. The, the couple of people that helped me out with like some cover art and that sort of thing. By all the, means, uh, everyone, they always say, don't judge a book by its cover, but everybody <laughs> does. I, I really like my cover art. I mean, more so than I expected that I would when I originally started working on this, but the, um, the cover for the protocols of Uma 
was done by a guy named Donald Samora. His last name is spelled S-E-M-O-R-A. And he has a website called www.bookcovershop.com. And he does sort of some computer-generated graphic sort of images. Um, and, and he does a lot of uh, uh, cover work for independent writers. Uh, and, and he's done... Um, He's done some nice, some nice work on both of these. And then the cover for Blinding Sky, which I just absolutely love, um, was done in combination with a, uh, she's a freelance artist from the UK named Roz Webb. And she's, she's mainly a painter, actually. And, and her paintings, generally speaking, are of, sort of like fashion, like women wearing dresses, that sort of thing, except they're not, um, I don't know, I'm not much of a visual artist, so I don't know what the terminology would be, but it's it's not like realistic, it's sort of a, but it's not really impressionistic either, but it's kind of a flowing style, and so I originally, um, the problem with using her as a cover artist is that she paints everything, and so it's hard for her. It's hard for her to make changes because she can't. You know, it's not a computer-generated image that she can just tweak. If you want something to be done differently, she's got to go back and paint the whole thing all over again. But Blinding Sky has sort of a. Um, um, it, it, it's more of a color sensation than it is a picture of something. It's it's it's. I wanted to have the impression of this giant sun in the sky very bright, don't look at it, it'll hurt your eyes kind of a thing. And so I was working with her because I thought, you know, her painting would be perfect for that. And she found just the right uh, color palette and uh, put it together exactly the way that I wanted it to be. And then and then I took that file and lateraled it over to Don, and he did the work up with it on the computer um, until we ended up with the... the the cover for Blinding Sky. And so I'm, I'm really, of all of the things about my books uh, that, that I can say that I'm really happy with the most would be my two covers. And uh, I just wanted to give some credit to those two people um, because they both kind of do that. Uh, they do that sort of work kind of, you know, as part of their living. Um, and if anybody, and they're both available, you can find them on Facebook. Um, I think Roz is, it's either R-O-S, W E B B or R O Z. I don't remember off the top of my head, but she does some freelance painting and stuff too. And she does covers mostly for like children's books and that sort of thing. So, and then Don does all kinds of different covers. So, if people are interested in uh, looking up, um, you know, somebody to do cover art for them, depending on what they need, those would be a couple of good people I think that they could check out and uh, um, see what they have to offer. And, John, if you will shoot me their websites or their Facebook pages, I can include them in the description of the show. I will absolutely do that. All right. And now it's time for you to give out your social media information like I ask every guest in the coffee shop to do. Okay. I have uh, a couple, three different sources. One is my, I have a Facebook page, and it's just John Bragg. It's, it's at John Bragg author, um, and it's got posts about my books and, and, and the things that I'm kind of working on and updates, et cetera, et cetera. I also have a Twitter uh, account, which is at jbragg67, um, that I do, you know, I, I tend to comment on other things besides just writing, but for the most part, it is a, uh, it is just, for the most part, it's writing. It's not entirely. I do like to make uh, um, comments on, uh, about politics and sports and that sort of thing. Um, and then I also have a uh, Goodreads page um, where I have uh, you know, information about myself, information about my books. There's, there's some reviews of my books uh, that um, are on good reads that aren't on uh, Amazon, for example. Uh, and that page is just www.goodreads.com 
goodreads.com backslash jrjrb67. Well, I think that means it's time for me to pour myself a cup of coffee and pick up the protocols of Uma and settle down with the pages of a good book. And as a reminder, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse's POV. And you can shoot me an email at the station, jesse, J-E-S-S-I-E, at klrnradio.com. And thank you very much, John, for joining me in the coffee shop. And I look forward to seeing all of you next time in the coffee shop. Thanks for having me. More than welcome. (laughs) 